Bonjour, un, deux, bonjour à tous. Vous m'entendez You hear me It's okay um, You know, I grew up in south of France. Je suis grandi dans le sud de la France. So I have a very bad accent in French. J'ai un très mauvais accent en français. So I'm going to speak English then. Okay uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Lourdes. It's a very interesting name for French, Lourdes. You might not know what it means, but it means a lot. And Anna Laura in Monterey uh, that invited me. You're welcome, come on. If the party is here, <laughs> the, the evening. Uh, and I'm <coughs> glad to be here in uh, Tech de Monterey. Actually, I've been in uh, Monterey for some seminaries, uh, some classes. I also I was also in Guadalajara, Tech Monterey in Guadalajara. And now in Mexico, so I, don't, I know there is 20 others, so I might have other conferences to do, but at least I've been in three of uh, three campuses of this school, free campus, so I'm pretty glad to, to be here with you today again. Uh, what I'm going to do, um, we have an hour, it's not very long, especially uh, I wrote, uh, I mean, I'm going to speak about free books uh, today, uh, so the free books, if you make them in one, it's probably, I don't know, 1,800 pages. I've done also a PhD, a master, a PhD dissertation on this subject, which is 3,000 pages. Of course, all that in one hour is just not possible. But so I give you more just hypotheses and quick conclusions, uh, and sorry for that. Uh, you, my, um, my books are at the library, good, very good library here that, uh, that Lourdes is the director of. And so I hope I will help you to maybe to go uh, further in this um, subject. And again, I'm sorry just to, to summarize ideas that might be more, uh, that might need more time. Um, just um, one word of it's better to be with you because I'm like, I look like uh, um, just maybe some a bit some things about uh, my methodology and, and what I'm doing. Basically, uh, right now I'm doing um, research um, with um, with um, I'm really trying to be on the field, on the ground to do research about what I'm uh, writing. I've done a PhD, as I told you before, uh, so it was a very academic, traditional work. Right now, I'm working more on uh, field research, so it's between academic and journalist kind of work. And I've spent the last uh, couple of years, I mean five, uh, seven years, to, to travel, uh, to do interviews. It's more than, I don't know, two, 2,000, um, 2,500 interviews in more than 50 countries. So it's a lot of uh, miles uh, with airplanes. Uh, it's not very good for environment uh, eco ecology, I know. But uh, uh, so whatever I, I write, uh, it's linked to uh, something I've seen myself. So everything is first hand. Of course, I use statistics, I use uh, data, I, uh, I read books and articles, but basically my books are really linked to research that I do myself on the ground. Um, and I believe even on a subject like internet, which is my last books, is important to go on the ground. You can think, you can, I mean, when you think about the internet, you, you can be here, you know, with your computer, and then you travel the world on the internet, and you don't necessarily have to go on the ground. Why? What it means to go to India or to China if you can see basically the website on your own computer? My hypothesis and my work is basically saying that you cannot do that. You cannot understand internet if you don't go everywhere to see how the people use internet, what kind of content they, they, they download, they read, what are the social networks they use, and then you, you have another view. I don't 
necessarily think it's a better one, but at least it's a different one. And I would say it's more close to reality. And I'm going to try to show you that during this uh, uh, intervention. Basically, I published three books recently. One, uh, Cultural Mainstream, is a book about uh, uh, globalization and content and culture. Uh, the second one, uh, which is a smaller book and uh, in a way a quicker one, I took just one small uh, issue, which is the LGBT issue, and the book is called uh, Global Gay and is translated in Spanish as well, about how the world is changing, sometimes uh, and quite often for the better, sometimes for the worst, with this issue, which is, a, in fact, a human right issue, a civil right issue, and how it affects how globalization has an effect on identities and or on um, uh, this kind of civil right fight. And the last book, which is uh, actually, uh, I think there is some copy here, but the book won't be uh, published in Spanish uh, before uh, the beginning of December here, so in three, four weeks. It's a book called Smart, and it's a book about the internet uh, worldwide. And I'm going to go in the details in a little bit these three books. Uh, but they, they look different, but they kind of are in the same kind of package in a way. Um, one of the main conclusions of the three books is about globalization and in the three subject I see how globalization is not a uniformization. So the fact that you can access every content on the internet, that you can live a better life when you are gay, for example, not everywhere, but at least in many places. The fact also that uh, uh, culture is more globalized doesn't mean at the end that it becomes totally, uh, that it becomes uniformized. When you look at my book, uh, Cultural Mainstream, if you just read the title, you, you, you might believe that the conclusion of the book says, you know, we are going to a more mainstream culture and everywhere will look at content, will we'll share the same content and actually we will be in a large global conversation and everybody will be part of that. Languages won't be as important as before, culture will be more uniformized and uh, borders won't exist. Basically, my three books are saying this is not what's happening. What we see on the ground, what we see, I do mainly qualitative research, but I use also quantitative one, we don't see a uniformization. On the contrary, and this is why actually the gay issue is interesting because we believe that the gay are very global and you know they all like, I don't know, Lady Gaga and Ricky Martin and Brokeback Mountain and Milk and you know the coming out, the gay pride, the uh, all, all these kind of things. But actually, they are more different than ever everywhere. And there is not such a thing as a global gay, actually. And the second element of uh, my books, the second, I would say, large conclusion, is about emerging countries. And in a way, it's about uh, Mexico as well. When we speak about emerging countries, first of all, we, we, believe, we sometimes speak only about the, the cold bricks. You know, you know that very well. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, of course, I believe, like other scholars, that it's not just five countries. It's also, it's also Colombia, it's also Mexico, it's also Chile, it's also Vietnam, probably, for sure, Turkey, uh, probably, uh, uh, maybe Egypt, depending on the, the next steps of the democracy there, uh, maybe even Iran, or Nigeria, or Kenya. So it's a group of 20 20 plus, 25 plus countries. And uh, one of the main conclusions of my three books, and I would say it's probably one of the reasons, I mean, the Indians and the Chinese told me that, that they published the book uh, in, uh, in many languages. We, we, we have a lot of scholars and a lot of people have spoken about the globalization as link, as, I mean, with a link with dem demography and with economics, of course. And I'm not the first one. Um, 
billions of articles have been written on globalization in, in this way. But I see globalization also as a process that in addition of demography, in addition of economics, it's also linked to identity, it's also linked to emerging culture, but the fact that emerging countries are also emerging with their culture, and it was basically the conclusion of mainstream. They emerge also with their values and human rights, and it was the conclusion of global gay, and they emerge also with their internet, and it is the conclusion of uh, smart. So right now, I'm going to focus a little bit on Mexico, then on emerging countries, uh, speak about the US, cultural industries, diversity, uh, the definition of culture, uh, and then I will conclude with the internet. Uh, I hope we will have also some exchanges, some questions at the end of the, the hour, if you, if you want, and uh, I will be happy also to exchange with, with you. Um, I'm, I begin with Mexico because uh, um, it's interesting for me, and I will begin with um, actually with two or three uh, images. I, you know, I'm French, so we are very uh, not uh, very formal, so I take that out. I have the French flag, so I think it's uh, it's at least it's good. Don't know how to put that, maybe like that. Does it work? Mm. I'm, I'm going to take the plane to go back to Paris in a few hours, so I have the French flag already, you know, to be ready to come back home. Um, I'm going to begin with three images. And uh, I begin in Mexico, where I met a few, a few years ago. Uh, somebody, his name is James Campos Vasquez, he's in my book Mainstream. He was a nice guy, he was very friendly with me. He's a Peruvian, actually, from uh, uh, citizenship. Uh, when I met him um, he, here in Mexico City, um, I remember he had uh, like uh, a tie, a very old one, uh, looked like Vasarilli. I don't know if you know Vasarilli, it's a French artist. Very square, actually, <laughs> from the 70s. Nobody buy any any work of this guy, even though he's pretty famous. He has been famous a uh, long time ago. And uh, the the tie was a Vasarilli kind of piece of art, which, which shows something about how you know modern he was. But whatever, I don't want to be mean. And this guy was the head of the MPA Mexico. The MPA is the lobby, the main lobby of the of the movie industry, Hollywood, actually. And uh, the MPA um, works basically here, but also in Brazil, also in different ways in Argentina, in Colombia, to protect the Hollywood industry. And they protect as also at the same time the music industry. So they do the movie and the, and, and the music industry because they have a, it's kind of technical, but they have another arm kind of of their organization that is called Association Protectora de Cine y Musica, and both are working together. So the guy was very nice, and you know he was uh, speaking, uh, uh, he was explaining me how he, his fight here is to protect the movies, to avoid any regulation by the Mexican government to protect the Mexican films, and so his goal is main, mainly to keep the film industry open to have the US uh, working well at home here. They do the same again in Brazil and in other countries. It used to be, he told me, so it's not a secret because he told me that publicly, uh, he used to work for the secret service in Peru. We don't know why <laughs> from Peru is here, but whatever. And uh, of course, he's directly linked to the MPAA office in Washington, DC where a lot of police people also are working about privacy, uh, uh, the technology downloading, about uh, security files and all this kind of thing to protect the movie and the music. And uh, when I spoke to him, he said that he's dealing every day with two, uh, with, with the, the president of the MPAA in, in, in Washington. I went there and I met, I went there several times actually, 
and I met the three main president of the MPAA in the US. They are very famous people, and they have been, uh, they have been, uh, they are extremely rich. I think they are paid uh, several millions dollars a year just to be president of these things. And the first one I met was Jack Valenti. Jack Valenti is very famous uh, in the movie industry. He has been the head for a long time, uh, the head of the MPAA in in, in Washington D.C. And when I, met, when I met him, he was already old, he died uh, recently. Uh, it, it's funny because he's a very little guy, but extremely powerful, you know, like a cowboy. And uh, I saw him, and then he took me by hand, you know, you have to follow him. And he said, you come, come here. So I came in the part of his office, it was a very big office, and he, saw, he showed me a photograph. And on this photograph, on this photograph, he was, uh, he, he was, very little, but he was on the photograph decades before. And the photograph is one of the most famous, probably uh, famous photograph, photograph in the history of the US. It is, uh, uh, you see President Johnson with the hand like that. Uh, close to him, there is Jackie Kennedy. Another woman with the Supreme Court members. Jack Valenti, little one behind. And again, behind, but you don't see that on the photograph, but we know that, of course. It's uh, the, the body of Kennedy, which had been killed just a few hours before. So the photograph is very famous because it's, uh, it's in the plane, it's uh, in Air, Air Force One, just a few hours after the killing. Uh, and the plane is on Dallas Airport, then it goes back to Washington with Johnson. And at that very moment, President Johnson become president because the Supreme Court member uh, appointed him, him immediately president after the, the killing. Then after, after a while, I went back to, to the MPAA and the new president arrived. Jack Valenti was already pretty old, uh, more than 85, 87 years old. And I met this new president. Uh, his name is Dan Glickman. And Dan Glickman uh, had been, in the past, uh, is a, he's a congressman, he has been very famous congressman, Democrat from Kansas, and uh, uh, where he was dealing on agriculture issue, especially quotas, and he became uh, the head, uh, he became first of all the Minister of Agriculture of Bill Clinton, and then he was appointed at the MPAA for the movie. When I spoke to him, uh, and I've met him several times, so we were a kind of, not really friend, but at least we, we know a bit each other. And I said, you know, Dan, you, you made a mistake. You, you're in charge of the movie industry, culture, but you were minister of agriculture. So something wrong, you know, agriculture, culture, <laughs> you're not in the right office. Then he said to me, um, it's you that you're wrong, Frederick, because, you know, my job before was to grow corn, and now I sell it as popcorn. Of course, it's a joke, but what it means by, by, by that, if you take the free guy, James Campos Vasquez here, working to protect the movie industry here, then Jack Valenti, who has been one of the key and the most important Johnson, President Johnson advisor, and then if you take Dan Glickman, that used to be Minister of Agriculture and became head of the MPAA, you see how, for the US, the movie industry is extremely important. The people that are in charge of the movie industry are not, you know, Saltin Bank. They are at the core of the American society, advisor of president, people in charge of security issues and the FBI kind of things or former Minister of Agriculture that was dealing with quotas for corn or other agricultural products, and now working on quotas and this kind of thing for the movie industry and music one. I think it's extremely um, interesting uh, to see how uh, it works and how actually for what we call the soft power, which means, uh, you know, the soft power expression, influence through movie, culture, the internet, values, Basically, my subject, you need people that are, have been working also on the hard power before, which means more security, military, this kind of things. <clears throat> now, if you look at 
what's going on after this example, uh, you realize how, um, if we are back on, the, on, on, on Mexico right now, you see how, it's not the only reason, how you explain that in Mexico, for example, 90% of the box office for the movie industry is for US American movies. They work well. And they work well actually everywhere in Latin America. When we, when we speak about uh, culture, at the same time, the movie industry is kind of an exception. And uh, uh, I have made uh, um, in my research a lot of uh, uh, interviews, a lot of I, I, I look at, uh, I, I used uh, tons of statistics as well to look how globalization affects uh, culture and content in the music industry, movie industry, books industry, video games, and so on. And uh, it's true that everywhere in the world, in everywhere in the world, you have a kind of uh, a global mainstream. Uh, there is some exception, uh, but basically, uh, Beyoncé, uh, <laughs> Lady Gaga, Kanye West, uh, Justin Timberlake, and we can take many of them, Avatar movie, uh, Spider-Man, and whatever, are kind of successful everywhere in the world, more or less. Less in India, for example, or the box office for the movie industry is 80% for Indian movies, the so-called Bollywood. In France, it's about 50%, 50 US, 50 French, and, and a few, 3 or 4% for <laughs> all the other one. Uh, in Japan, it's about 50-50 as well. Japan, 50 and the US, 50. In China, it's about 50-50. Uh, Czech Republic, 50-50. But in, in many other countries, it's more 10% for the local and 80% for the US. And in Latin America, you're very successful because it's more 90, 95 to 5. There is a kind of Rui born right now in Argentina. I will go back on that a bit later. If you take the video games industry, it's even worse. Um, I mean, worse. If you think it's good to have more diversity by, by state, if you think U.S. content are great, and actually I love the American culture. I've, did, I've done my PhD, I lived there for several years. But uh, uh, at least the video game industry is not very diverse. Sometimes the, the studios in the video game industry are not American. For a few years ago, even like two years ago, the French were the first producer in the video game industry. You might not know that, but Activision, Blizzard, Ubisoft were all French company. Part of Vivendi for Activision and Blizzard and independent for U Ubisoft. We sold uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, Activision Blizzard, which are now back US company. But it has been for a long time a French one. But even though when we add uh, Activision and Blizzard, the video games weren't at all French. So we own the company through Vivendi, which is a French conglomerate, but it doesn't produce any French video games. And Ubisoft today, which is a very good French and, and you know, well-known brand, it is French, but if you see Ubisoft video games, with a few exceptions, they are mainly blockbuster American video games. And if you take uh, Sony or Nintendo, you will see also that the games that especially are produced by Nintendo can be a little bit kind of Japanese sometimes, but m more often they are very uniformized, mainstream kind of English um, kind of video games. So for the movie industry and the video game industry, the mainstream exists, and it's a very US-oriented mainstream. But I would say they are the, the only one, two exceptions. If you take all the other sector, information, television, TV, television series, if you take music, if you take books, um, it is much more diverse than that. And uh, actually, the mainstream is just one small part of the, of the culture that you cons consume. It's probably the only one that is really global, for sure. But in Mexico, the books that you read are quite often Mexican. 
the music you hear uh, is extremely Mexican as well. So uh, I don't think you can summarize uh, the mainstream as saying it is everywhere the same. Actually, it's everywhere very different. Uh, I don't know Mexican music very well, but uh, I've I've listened a lot of uh, um, Café, Café Tacuba, for example, Tigres de, de, de Norte, I know Los Angeles uh, Azules, I know RBD, I know uh, uh, Rigaton, actually I discovered uh, Rigaton, uh, in, of course, in Latin America, but especially here, uh, and not only Calle 13, but other things better. Uh, for the older one, there is also Molotov, but uh, it looks like a cocktail Molotov. But it was at that time, I think, they were against the, the, the power here, like Caifanes or other things. So we don't know that very well in France. I know a little bit that because I have a radio show every Sunday night that is called Soft Power on French National Public Radio. And actually, this is why I live tonight to be ready for my show on Sunday. You can listen to that if you speak French. Otherwise, you will listen to some, uh, some Mexican music sometimes, because I try to put music from many countries. But to tell you the truth, huh, don't, don't cry, don't leave the, the room immediately. We are not listening Mexican Mexican music in France at all. And I don't think you listen a lot of South Korean music here. You know probably uh, some K-pop artist, I mean one, which is Psy, with the, the stupido kind of things. Uh, Gangnam style that everybody has seen, but okay, three times of your life. You don't listen to this kind of music a lot. If you're in South Korea, you will listen to K-pop all the time. And you won't mix that with J-pop, which is the pop in Japan. Or with, uh, Kore with um, uh, Cantonese pop, what we call Canto pop, more in Hong Kong. Or with Mandarin pop that is very popular in mainland China. And if you say to a South Korea person, what about J-pop? He won't like that. He likes K-pop, and K-pop is not J-pop, and so on and so forth. So music is extremely diverse everywhere. And I could uh, tell you, I could give you a lot of uh, French names about uh, uh, music that you don't even know. So, by the way, Charles Aznavour and, uh, and Jacques Brel are not the current hit in France. For those who are still listening, the things that even my grandmother thinks they were already uh, square. Uh, if we go on the book industry, I mean, for that, uh, at least we know, we know Octavio Paz, we know uh, um, Carlos Fuentes, we know, we know some other writers, but literature and non-fiction are extremely national. You have the big blog blockbuster bestsellers, Dan Brown everywhere in the world, or, or Fifty Shades of Grey, or these kind of things, but they are just, they are American, of course, or English sometimes, sometimes. but a lot of books you read here are in Spanish, of course, and they are also by Mexican writers. So actually, the idea of having uh, uh, the, the globalization as a uniformization doesn't work, doesn't, doesn't work very well. But it doesn't mean, for example, for Latin America, that uh, you have a Latin America culture. As a French, I think the European has invented the, this idea of Latin America. We are the only one to believe it exists. And when, when I came in Latin America for the first time, I tried to find Latino culture, and I didn't. Because as you know more than I do, uh, it's an extremely diverse continent. I mean, first of all, there is Brazil, and it's like if it would be another continent. You don't mix with Brazil, basically. And uh, even Argentina, as you know, uh, is not close to you for many reasons. And uh, there is some exception, probably uh, you might know Los Fabulos uh, Cadillac. Uh, I, I love, uh, I love uh, Carnet de Voyage, uh, I think in English, Motorcycle Diary, the movie, uh, which was actually a very uh, interesting movie because it was a mix of a Brazilian, if I remember well, director, Walter Sales, uh, with, of course, uh, a Mexican uh, actor, Gael Garcia Bernal. Uh, I think it was Argentine actor, Rodrigo um, de la Serna, for the other character. The, the writer was Puerto Rican, Jose Rivera, and the music, I think, was from Uruguay. So it was kind of a Latino movie. But how many, do you see, how many Latino movies do you have? How many band or even reggaeton music, even uh, 
uh, books uh, that are extremely Latino and that are shared everywhere in Latin America. If I would be uh, mean, I would say Mexican culture, Mexican people or Latino people, if, if such a thing exists, have two cultures, their own and the US culture. In a way, it's the same in Europe. We, as the French, I mean, don't repeat that. But we don't care about what the Romanian and the Polish are doing in movie industry and books. Nobody read anything like that. And actually, the German don't really like what the French do. And the Spanish are not reading a lot of Italian. There is some exception. You will give me probably some movie of Almodovar and then the books uh, of uh, some writers. And we got two Nobel Prize recently even though the Minister of Culture wasn't even able of, in France to give away one name of the books he, he wrote. <laughs> it was a big scandal in France because she had a lunch with him. But then the TV said, oh, you love him, you had a lunch with him, he got the Nobel Prize. How do you think, uh, what did you read? Uh, and she wasn't even able to give a name of one book she, he, he wrote. So, uh, but more Bad than that, it's the fact that we don't share anything quite often with the European. And today, when you, has, you are a young kid in high school or in university, you know, you, you know French culture when you're in France, you know German culture when you're in Germany, you know Spanish culture when you're in Spain, and American culture, but US culture. But you don't know a lot of other um, European things, which is kind of bad. So, for me, the question now is to look a little bit how and why the US are so powerful. How? As I said before, they are not the only one. In many countries, national culture is still very powerful. So, globalization is not a uniformization, but they still are very powerful. So, I will give you a few elements to explain, uh, and probably you already know a lot of them, but and you have a lot of, you can guess yourself, but I've made uh, extensive research on that to see why the US are able to have a great soft power influence, why they are so powerful in the movie industry, the video game industry, and also sometimes in music, in, uh, in books as well. You can come and sit down, don't... Uh, I, I'm not going to, or maybe you, you don't want to mix up with me, but uh, there is a lot of seats here. And if you all sit, I will sit also myself. No. So I think there is many, many explanations that we can use, probably much more than what I'm going to say right now. But I would say the main one are for me the kind of culture they produce, the change of the definition of culture, the cultural diversity, of course, creative industries uh, are for me the key, the key points. And I'm going to go very quickly on all of them. I believe one of the reasons why the US uh, is so strong in, in culture is first of all because uh, they are able to work on, on different, different scale and different kind of culture, in all kind of culture, actually. We, we believe in general, and all the, you know, Guevarist, uh, Trotskyist, Marxist people, we have a lot of that in France, and, and sometimes they are funny, uh, and I kind of like them sometimes. They believe, you know, the problem of the US is imperialism, and they believe it's because they are imperialist, because they have very strong cultural industries, which is just a question of marketing, money, and mass culture. And because of that, they are able to be powerful everywhere in the world with uh, Disney and you know, Avatar and Spider-Man and even uh, um, Kanye West. Yes, Kanye West as well. And of course, uh, there is no debate about that. They are very powerful with mass culture, Broadway, Hollywood, uh, the music industry in, in Los Angeles and also uh, the, the video game industry. But I will argue that actually in addition of that, they are also very powerful in the other, other kind of culture. When you go in a, 
for example, in the dance festival in France, you will see that a lot of the artists will be dancers from the US, from Merced Cunningham to Martha Graham, from Bill T. Jones to Trisha Brown, and so on and so forth. When you look at theater, a lot of people will speak about Tony Kirchner and the Wooster Group, and so on and so forth. And also high culture, and also counter culture. And by the way, if you want to understand the Silicon Valley, and it's, a, a, I hope, I guess, a key chapter in my next book, Smart, I look at the Silicon Valley and the history of the Silicon Valley. And if you believe, and I, maybe some people in Mexico or in France believe that, this is just a question that you know, the government will say, OK, we, or the mayor, we are going to build a smart city that is becoming that will become Silicon Valley in this place, it's going to be wrong. Nobody, no government, no, no, no president, no uh, mayor has said, I'm going to build the Silicon Valley there. If you want to understand the Silicon Valley, which is a singularity, idiosyncrasy, extremely um, original, you have to go back on the highway system of Hayes and Aware in the 50s. You have to go back on the how the airport of San Francisco became a hub. You have to go back on the hippies in the 60s and Jack Kerouac on the road. You know, they went to San Francisco, the beat generation. So it's linked actually to Kerouac, Cassidy, Ginsberg on the road, the beat generation, and even the Castro, the gay, the gay, uh, the gay area in, in San Francisco, the veggie lesbians, the, the venture capitalist, of course, the exurb, which is exurbia, which is how a city um, goes, I mean, you have a second suburb and then a third suburb that we call exurb, which is highway and shopping malls. I mean, you know that because sometimes Mexico becomes a little bit like that too. Uh, all that, explain Silicon Valley, and probably many other things. I have wrote a chapter on that, so there is many other elements. So it's not something, even though, uh, you know, I don't know, Marcel Ebrard, for example, say, okay, I'm going to build in Mexico a smart city because I believe the city uh, needs a, a, a smart city. It won't work. It's not something you can decide. It's a long process. It has been the case for, for decades. So basically, uh, Mass culture, high culture, counterculture, internet culture, community culture as well. You can be, if you, if you go to Europe, you will be extremely, um, I would say, impressed or maybe shocked. Uh, for example, you, you go in a ghetto in France where lives mainly Arab people. It's kind of poor area. They are very anti-American because of Israel policy but they are extremely connected to U.S. culture. Connected with the gangster rap, they are connected with uh, um, movies, uh, blockbuster, but also whenever there is blacks or this kind of actors and, and so on and so forth. So it's mainstream, but it's also very community oriented. They know artists that we, I mean, the mainstream doesn't know, that goes directly with them. So I do believe that it's, it is, at the end, the reason why the U.S., for one part, is very successful in soft power and culture. It's because they play on every kind of scale, every kind of culture at the same time. And when you want to criticize the U.S., in French, we are very good on that. And I think we share that a little bit with Mexico and this kind of love-hate relationships. In France, we hate the, the U.S., but we are the first country in the world with McDonald's number by, by inhabitants. And uh, we, Google is 90 or 85% of the search engine in France, where even in the US is not that high. So it's always interesting to see when you don't like a country, you can also like it in another way. But I, at the end, when you want to criticize the US system, we read the Monde Diplomatique in France, which are quite often translation of articles from the nation, the US magazine. We uh, watch the movie of Michael Moore and, and listen, uh, read the book of Noam Chomsky. So basically, it's American that are criticizing the US. So at the end, I think this is more, this is really that imperialism and uh, the mass and the counterculture, the community culture and the internet culture, the, uh, the high culture and the low culture all together. 
Avatar and I will say the photograph Nan Goldin, um, Spider-Man and Tony Kushner, the, the, the gay uh, Jewish uh, playwright, uh, Batman and Ang Lee at the same time. The second element of one of the reasons why the U.S. are so powerful in culture, it's of course cultural and industries. And scholars for a long time, uh, politicians have seen the cultural industry uh, structure uh, as a key factor, of course, of the powerful uh, culture that the U.S. produce. And we quite often believe that it's because of the market. You might know the, the Frankfurt School uh, in the 40s, in the 50s, writers like Benjamin, Horkheimer, um, Adorno, of course. They Even Anna Arendt, which wasn't part of the of the Frankfurt School, but she was also thinking that cultural industry were kind of bad and, you know, the guy that owns the corporation will decide what kind of content will be produced and it will be product, cultural product, that will be made by conglomerate, kind of factory, everybody works for the factory, at the end you have the product and then basically it becomes um, a, a way to, to influence people with this kind of culture. The problem is that today, the conglomerate don't exist, at least as they were existing. They don't do product, nobody works for them full time, and the, the independent works with them. So actually, it's a totally pic different picture than what used to be. And uh, I don't have the time here, but I can take, uh, uh, I, I can explain that for the movie industry, for the music industry, for the book industry, for the video game industry, they kind of all work in a totally different way than what the cultural industry critics thought they, 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 they are. Of course, they were in the 40s and the 50s, so it's, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of Benjamin, so it's not, I don't want to criticize this kind of writer, but of course the world is very different today than what it used to be, and for this very reason, their, their theory doesn't necessarily work very well. I don't even speak about the Adorno articles about jazz. You know, maybe the story would be a long debate, but basically for Adorno, jazz cannot be really a culture because, you know, for him, he wasn't racist, but for him, culture means, you know, white, elite, European things. And adding something from the black couldn't be culture. So, he was kind of smart and he said at the end, can it be culture? So it is radio. So the famous articles about how the jazz is radio are interesting, but of course nobody today will say jazz is radio. Everybody will say jazz is music, so it's culture, and it's even probably the more classical uh, music of the 20th century. But to come back on the cultural industries, very quickly, what, how it works today, I would say you have the big major in the movie industry, in the mu movie industry, music industry, in the book industry, studios also in the video game industry. They are kind of banks. So they, they have the money, they, they are banks, and basically they fund projects. And they have what we call the green light, which is very important. They will say yes or no to one movie or to one book or whatever. It costs a lot of money. Today, a blockbuster in the movie industry can be 400, 500 million dollars just for one um, feature film. But then it is done in general by a producing house, which is either within the big studio, what we call a specialized unit, or a little bit outside, they fund the, the, the producing house. So it's a kind of independent funded by them. And then this producing house hire other company, sometimes 20, 30, sometimes 100, independent, which can be startup, which can be small businesses, which can be other studio, that will work on a specific project. Nobody is an employee. Everybody has a contract for one movie. Some actors can have for two or three, but in general, it's a project-based model, totally the opposite, the opposite of the traditional um, gold age, golden age of the Hollywood movie where everybody was working full time to do not one, but plenty of movies altogether. So the studios are still very influential, but they work with independent 
And it's the same in the video game industry. You will see big blockbuster quite often. You don't know that. But there is a lot of small... Uh, because they are not able, for example, if they do a, a movie for uh, a video game, sorry, for 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 the the PS3, then uh, they they want to do that for uh, another video game platform uh, for the Nintendo, for example, and they don't have the money, so uh, they they uh, or the tools, so they ask another studio to do it and to sell it and and so on. But also for special effects, for some character, for the music, for many other things, they will hire several companies that will make, actually at the end, a real um, main uh, video game. In the music, the same with the labels. In the book industry, with the imprints. Uh, so you are in a small imprint. You know your, the guy you work with, your publisher, and so on. And it's part of a very large group that, in general, do all the, the, it does all the back office, international rights, uh, the printing, these kind of things, but all the creative process, the marketing and the, the publicity and the PR relations are, are still in the small imprint. So you have the big and the small all together. And this is why quite often we, uh, we mix up a little bit, uh, uh, we, we don't see that as a, as a key element. To finish uh, on that, uh, I don't want to be too, too long, uh, of course uh, it used to be products, cultural goods, and now it's much more content, content that you will use on several platforms, several medias. There are also streams, they can be services, they can be formats, apps, so many things, but not just one cultural good. There is two other elements. I'm going to go very quick on that because I don't even have uh, I don't have the time to go on that very quickly. But uh, another reason is probably that the and it's linked with which what I've said just before with uh, uh, Adorno. We used to to think, especially the French, we are very good on that. And uh, sometimes uh, in Latin America, in Argentina, you have that too because they they look at Europe a lot. This kind of hierarchy for culture. So basically. We believe there is such thing as the art, and it is high culture. And then there is all the other things, basically. And at the end, you have, uh, I don't know, rigaton, and it is low culture, and of course, it's not good. This is the way, quite often, actually, we, we believe art is uh, in France and in Europe. You have that also in Germany a lot, in Spain, in Italy. Vargas Llosa kind of things. I had a fight with him uh, in, in his book. He, he commented my own book, and we actually it was very friendly. But uh, basically, he said he did a very good job. I love what he said. But the culture he described, I don't like that. I don't want that. It's funny because you know when it's raining, what do you say? I don't like rain. Yes, but it's still raining. So the thing is more to understand why the people are liking a culture that is not what you like. And the reality is that the hierarchy, as we believe in it, with the high-low culture, doesn't exist anymore. And it even less exists because of the globalization and because of the internet. So video games, of course, it, it can be hard. Uh, Siri TVs, mangas, startup, publicity, design, all, all that is also part of the arts. And uh, a few um, years ago, the more probably arty kind of high culture French uh, uh, journal, the Cahiers du Cinéma, like the, the traditional Godard, Truffaut uh, re, uh, journal for, for movie industry, said, you know, series TVs, American series TVs, US series TVs are the most creative right now. So even though, even them, they accept the idea of, you know, it's not that simple to say there is such a good things that is art uh, and, and a bad one that is cooked popular culture. Of course, another link, another also key element for, for to explain how the US is so powerful is what I call, uh, what I mean, a lot of people call cultural diversity. And I try to very quickly to, to give you a kind of uh, um, an element that my, and you might think about that later on. Um, we believe in Europe, it's also the case, I think, in, in Latin America quite often. I mean, Brazil has very, uh, I work a lot on that. India also, the Quebecois, of course, huh? you know, the, the Canadian that speak French. We believe in cultural diversity and we have 
made a lot of fight uh, at uh, UNESCO and uh, other international institutions about that. And I believe we were right. Uh, I've been in South Korea, and when you see how the US are destroying quotas for the movie industry just to have more US movies, blockbuster in South Korea and less South Korea movie, you realize how they really destroy cultural diversity. And when they did the disnegotiation, they uh, obtained, they, they were able to got rid of a part of the quota system. And a few years after that, the blockbuster from the US were much more important in the total box office than before. And the Korean, what we call Alawi, Al Alwi, how do you say that? Alwi, which is the new wave of Co South Korea movies and music, H-A-L-L-U-E, uh, uh, I think. Uh, it's like the, the K-pop as well is part of the Alwi, possibly. Possible, possible maybe. Uh, you see how he has a real reaction a real effect on the, the box office. And, and actually, what I said about Mexico uh, in the beginning with the movie industry, or how the US are working in Brazil or Argentina to destroy any way to fund the local uh, music industry to, to promote more their own music, is extremely uh, a key thing to destroy cultural diversity. Uh, but then, if we look at inside, we have a very different pictures. Uh, in France, for example, we believe in cultural diversity when, we, when it's abroad. But at home, what about the culture for the Arabs? We don't care. What about the local culture, the folk culture, the indigenous culture? We don't care. The Quebecois that are so proud about cultural diversity all the time, they didn't care about Aborigine culture. And don't even speak about the Chinese you know, that believe in cultural diversity when it's to have more Chinese product abroad. But when it's at home, speak about the Tibetan story, for example, or, may, or Taiwanese, or even right now Hong Kongese, and you will see what is the reality of cultural diversity at home. Whether in the US, it's exactly the opposite. I told you how they destroy cultural diversity abroad, but at home, they do it a lot. First of all, because, as you know, there is 51% of their population that is Hispanic. And among them, uh, 51, million, sorry, 51 million Hispanic people in the US, which means 15% of the population. And uh, I think there is 30, 29, 30 million Mexicans. Uh, 38 million of blacks, 15 million of Asian, among them probably close to 3 million Chinese. So it is a very diverse culture by definition. And uh, when, you, when you speak about you know, cultural diversity in France on the movie industry, we, we, we love uh, diversity. But then how many Chinese movies we have seen? A few. How many... Uh, how many Mexican movies we have seen? Probably none, or very few. Whether, of course, in the US, by definition, you have movies from Mexican just because you have Mexicans. And uh, uh, I, I, I think you got the point, but basically, I, you can think about that a bit more, but you know, the fact that you really believe in cultural diversity abroad, but you don't do it at home, or on the contrary, the US destroy cultural diversity abroad, but do it at home, it's for me extremely interesting, and I think it's part of the reason why they are also uh, very powerful, because they are able to produce a culture that already, from the beginning, is um, organized, it's, it, they think about the product as a, a product for the world, with characters that are blacks and, and more Latino right now, that are already uh, extremely diverse because they produce a culture that is more diverse, even though they destroy the diversity of culture abroad. To, to go a little bit more on, on that, I will go back now, after the US, on emerging country before finishing with the, with the internet. We have 10 more minutes, is okay? Um, so I, I told you a little bit before to, when, when I began, um, 
about emerging country, it's not just the BRICS, it's also uh, more 20 plus country. They emerge with their culture, with their values, with their um, internet. And we can take many examples of that. I mean, Al Jazeera, for example, but also NBC, Rotana, uh, groups like uh, Reliance in India, which bought a part of DreamWorks. And I don't know if you have heard the news this morning, but Alibaba is closed. It's a rumor, but it wasn't, uh, I mean, they didn't, uh, um, you know, say that it was fake or, or, or not real. So we believe it might be the case. They, they, were, they are buying uh, Lionsgate, Lionsgate, which is one of the key studios in the movie industry in the US. Uh, but Reli Reliance uh, bought a part of DreamWorks and Sarah, another big Indian giant bought, uh, uh, I mean, tried to, to buy uh, the Metro Goldwyn Mayer. They, at the end, they weren't able to do that, but you know, the lion, the famous Leo lion, the name is Leo, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century movie, could have been Indian, you know, would have been uh, Indian Leo <laughs> and not uh, a US lion. Uh, of course, TV Globo, as you know, it's a big player in the in the game, and then I don't even mention Televisa because you you won't like me if I do that. Uh, but uh, you know, like it or not, Televisa is a key player in the game of television uh, worldwide, and also with the debate that you know probably pretty well with Univision. They don't own Univision, but when you look at Univision, you believe they own it. <laughs> and uh, and of course, there is Telemundo that basically now thought to have also some telenovelas from Televisa, so at the end they are all the same, whatever. And uh, we can take many other examples with the K-pop, J-pop, CCTV in China. Uh, I, I don't have enough time to, to be more uh, in, the, in the detail of that, but you, you, you got the point, I, I guess. Just one quick, uh, I would say, um, image that I got on emerging country. I met a lot of start here in Mexico. I've been, uh, I told you, in Monterrey, but also in Veracruz. I've been in Puebla, Guadalajara, uh, Xelapa, you say Jalapa, right? <laughs> so several uh, cities in this country. Uh, but also in, uh, I met uh, startups, people that are doing cultural industry, sometimes owner of big multiplexes, uh, studios, and so on. Uh, in, uh, um, let's say, in Rio de Janeiro, in, in Dubai, in Shanghai, in Beirut, uh, in places like that, I, I met uh, hundreds of them. And I was kind of shocked. For me as a European, it's really a shock. How quite often you are in front of somebody is 45 years old. I mean, it looks uh, maybe old for you, but it's pretty young, you know, when you are the head of a big conglomerate or a multiplex. In general, in India, in Mumbai, in, in, in Rio de Janeiro, or in, uh, in, um, in Dubai, is very friendly, he open his arm and his eyes and he thinks about is creating, um, building the culture of the future, thanks to the internet. And you really got this impression at NBC in Riyadh, at Rotana in, uh, in Lebanon, or in many other places in emerging countries. And then I'm back in France, you know, and it's the same in Spain, the same in Italy, the same in Germany, sometimes the same in UK. And you are with the same guy, I mean, the owner of the studio or the owner of the, of the multiplex guy or some music uh, A&R people or, or startups. And more, quite often, they are 65 years old plus. Uh, they are not very friendly, but that's not a point. Sometimes they are friendly. But in general, they are like... It's very dangerous because we have to protect the culture of the past. And the kind of opposition between this very opportunities way of thinking of the culture of the future that I've seen in Mexico, and the idea of what's happening, globalization and digitalization is a threat for culture. In one side, very optimistic, in the other side, more pessimistic. In one side, aggressive, wanted to do things, enthusiastic. In the other side, pessimist, fearful, defensive, kind of chilly, is for me an extra, extremely interesting and for European side, sad comparison. 
at least uh, I would say that you have the chance to be in, in the good side of, uh, of the world, of history. And I really believe emerging countries can change their culture, can change the world and the internet because they, they don't have all the, you know, the problems we had uh, between, you know, the, the past, the, the traditional way of thinking of culture, how to, to make the transition from analogic to digital from, with the copyright and all this kind of stuff. I will finish uh, this presentation with a quick uh, note on the internet. Uh, even though I spoke already uh, about the internet uh, several times, um, what I've seen everywhere in the world, it's not uh, the global conversation that uh, some people in the Silicon Valley be believe in. If you speak uh, at Google, at Facebook, at Twitter, uh, I've been in uh, all these big uh, corporations uh, in the few, few last years, Quite often, and they wrote that in interviews, in books, they have said that, you know, we are entering a global conversation, as I told you in the beginning of this discussion. The frontiers are not as important as before, that the, uh, the content will be more global and more uniformized, and that at the end, they really believe uh, on something that is for sure U.S. culture, but they believe in something that will be uh, shared and in a good way, in a positive way, by everybody. What I've seen, what I've, what I've found uh, on the ground, in the field, in the last couple of years, uh, the last five years, actually, it's none of that. Uh, and I told you that before, but for me, the, what internet uh, is doing, it's not at all, a, the good word is not globalization. Internet is not more globalized than what we, we believe it is actually much more fragmented. So fragmentation is much more what internet will become that globalization. Um, there is a, a word uh, in English that is interesting that I don't know in Spanish, but I think you're like us. Uh, we, we have only one word for two ideas. It is the word frontier. En français, in French, frontier. And I think in Spanish it's kind of the same. In English, you have two words for frontier. You have border and you have frontier. The border, you know what is it? It's between Mexico and the US, which is, you know, you need a visa, you need a passport, there is the flag, there is the police, and so on and so forth. And so I will say there is no border on the internet, except with China, with uh, Iran, and also with Cuba, for example, because in Cuba, you you have a very bad access of the internet, even though the propaganda said, you know, we open a 100 plus cyber cafe. And I was in Cuba a few, a few weeks ago, and I went to the cafe and they don't exist. They just don't exist. So basically, if you want internet, either you have a, a military guy in your building and he share with you uh, and you have to pay, or you go in a big hotels, uh, international hotels, and it costs 10 euro an hour, which is of course uh, not possible for any, Cuban uh, normal people. So there is no border on the internet, for sure, but there is frontier. Frontier means a symbolic things, which means it's linked to language. It's linked to the cultural sphere you live in. It's linked with your territory. And uh, this is why, at the end, you can negotiate with the US uh, NAFTA, and you have done that. So then there is no border, but there is still some frontier. And I think it's extremely important. And actually, we are already 2.7 billion people on the internet worldwide. In five years, we will be 5 billion. In 10 years, probably close to 7 billion. All the people that today have uh, what we call a feature phone, a basic phone, will have a smartphone in the next years to come. Why? Because smartphones are already in Africa available at 30 or 40 dollars and even tablets. So access will be possible. Doesn't mean that we don't have to work on digital literacy, which is uh, an extremely important thing. I think the digital divide won't be the debate. The next debate is digital literacy. And actually libraries have a role to play on that. I believe libraries are a place where you should do digital literacy, which means, you know, 
okay, you have access to the web, but what about your data? What about your privacy? Wikipedia is wonderful. I love Wikipedia. When you're in Africa, you see how Wikipedia changed the life of the people. They have access to an encyclopedia that nobody was able to, to, to pay for a few years ago. And they even have dictionary that weren't existing for a lot of languages in India, in, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, in, in Kenya, in Cameroon. I've seen that, how the people access to dictionary on, for their own language where they weren't able to buy any dictionary before. Sometimes the dictionary weren't even existing. But sometimes, you know, there is mistake on Wikipedia or things that are not really good. This is why cultural uh, digital literacy is important. So I believe, basically, Internet is going to be more and more um, um, not really local, I don't say, I, I never said it was global, or we, we thought it was global and now it's local. It's not as simple. It is much complicated. It can be sometimes global for a community. For example, Mexicans, millions of Mexicans are speaking to millions of other Mexicans that live across the border. So it's not just in Mexico, it's two countries. But of course, it's still a conversation in Spanish between Mexicans. You have the same with Iran and Tehran Jeles, which is the the Iranian area in Los Angeles. Of course, Cuba and Miami and these kind of things, even though it doesn't work on, on, on the internet, but it works with uh, the so-called pen drivers, you say, uh, I think in Spanish, which is like a kind of uh, USB key that everybody has in Cuba. And with that, they get all the music they want and, and, and share. So they share their pen drives all the time. It's very interesting and, and funny. Every taxi has that, every house has that, and, and so on. So I believe um, um, territorialization is extremely important on the internet. And again, it is a good news for Mexico because internet is not such a thing that comes from the US that you basically receive as a kind of, I would say, uh, uh, domination and imperialism and without, and you won't have any, um, any way to protect from that. Infrastructure and software are, where are sometimes global, but content are not. Content don't travel well on the internet. And uh, uh, this is why, to conclude, I would say that um, um, I'm not an anti-American, uh, anti-US. I, I, again, I did my PhD there. I lived in the US, and actually, I love this country. Sometimes it's even more fun than to be in France for many reasons. Uh, but I think it is, you have the right, as Mexican, to protect your culture. I don't believe in quotas. I, of course, don't believe in censorship. But I believe on doing things that will make, basically, your content uh, um, available, first of all, for the Mexican. And first of all, I believe Internet will be more and more like that. Website, the content you will use, the music you will listen are very linked to where you live, the place you, um, you, where, where you, 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 you need information, the shops you go to buy and things and so on and so forth. So to conclude in, uh, in one sentence, I will say that actually Internet won't be, um, and globalization won't be good or bad uh, by, by themselves. It's not a question of to be pessimistic or to be optimistic. It's a question to be realistic. And so it will depend, basically, of what you, me, and actually all together, nosotros, will do, it, uh, will do with, with it. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Frederick. ¿Alguna pregunta? Comentario. We have 10 minutes, uh, a little bit more. More or less. 15, 20? También. Then I stay in Mexico because I miss my plane. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's up to you. You have to find me a, a party where I'm going tonight uh, if I stay here. <laughs> <laughs> but then I won't do my radio show Sunday, so I'd be not as good. Comentario. Anímense. Yes. Maybe two to begin with. Por favor, digan su nombre y la carrera que estudian. Si pueden hablar en inglés, mejor. Oh, hi, Frederick. Um, hi. My name is 
Edgar. I study communications and digital media. And well, actually, my, my question goes, it's, it's about what you talked about in the U.S. and the way they um, manage culture. Uh, my, some the classmates and me were making this investigation on actually gay a perception of the way the gay culture has been used by the American media. Well, oh, well, they are the the main culture pro, cultural pro, producers, and we were discussing this like uh, two-sided treatment the gay culture has had. Uh, on one side, there's uh, this acceptance and this, like I don't know, approach they having like being gay is okay and and it's bad to to I don't know like promote uh, homophobic uh, behaviors and things like that. But at the same time, on a more um, individual level, or I wouldn't like to call it like that. It's like more in a community level there's still this, I don't know how to say it, like uh, the people still don't accept 100% this kind of uh, way of living, you know? And w well, my question goes in, how do you deal with that? Because I was reading your intro the introduction to Global Gate, your book, and this books at Cafe uh, thing. In, in Jordan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. And I investigated a little bit more, and actually it has been closed. I know, I know. And here in Mexico, it's like kind of the same way. Here in the city, we are very, like, we accept the gay culture and things like that. But at the same time, there's like this double entendre that that it's not okay to be gay or something like that. So well, you, can you comment on that? Uh, well, hi. I Well, my group arrived a little late. We were in the class, but... Uh, I yes, want I to. Yes, I saw. I know. Yeah. I noticed that. <laughs> yes. um, first of all, I want. Well, my name is Jose Pablo. Um, I'm studying international relations. Uh, I want to congratulate you because I think it was a very clear uh, perspective about culture. And during our class, along all the semester, we we talked a lot about the fact of culture, about if it's the process, it's ha it's being uh, applied to culture because of globalization and we got to um, agree on, on some points for example the the fact of as you were saying like the homogenization from the US and in the other hand the dissemination for other cultures but one of the interesting facts we got to see was that uh, even though t different cultures get to interact between each other, there is some point where there is some kind of resistance from one to another to evict a complete homogenization. And uh, well, I, I think that's a very interesting point to say why even though our influence on the media and on economics and all, on all of that stuff has been very related to the US, still we are very profound with our values, with an, our uh, traditions. And I think that's very interesting what you were saying about the, also about the fact of internet, right? Like how it has been very territorial and fragmented. And um, well, I just wanted to congratulate and you and I think that's very interesting you know, how to know even though we were seeing that there's a theory that says that in order to to be a, like an interaction or a, um, yeah mostly an interaction between cultures there have to be like out of four out of five points four have to be like common you know like for example Mexico and Argentina have like the right or the chance to interact because of the language, because of the past, because of their food, and because of maybe another thing. But there will be always something there that will be like your identity or your origins that will remain and that will not be um, letting a total homogenization. 
that's what I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, third uh, is he here? We can take three or four. You also? You you don't arrive you, you didn't arrive late, right? Okay. No, no, it's just to be <laughs> Hi You're Frederick. Right. Sorry. Hi. My name is Andrea. Hi Andrea. Uh, I study journalism. I like the Spanish, yeah. like, <laughs> hi Frederick. <laughs> I study journalism. And in Spanish it's more common that in French. <laughs> in French you say <laughs> Mr. Professor. Yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, Monsieur. <laughs> but I don't do that, sorry. <laughs> um, well, at this class, uh, my creative writing class, uh, our professor was telling us that when a system criticizes the same system, it is not considered a, a real or an authentic uh, critic uh, uh, criticism towards the system because he was uh, telling us that it is kind of uh, making ourselves look stupid, um, believing that the system is so strong that it is able to criticize itself and still be still that strong. So I don't know, I want to know what you think about that. Uh, so basically, it's on the the fact that you are able to criticize the system, but still, uh, still, uh -huh, still be yes. inside the system and still yes. be not able to question and the yes. system. Yes, Ex extremely like good question. You? Thank you. Yes. And then the last one, if there is. Hi, my name is Rodolfo, and I study communication and digital media. Uh, my question is uh, really concrete. Uh, what do you think that is needed for a change in the cultural industry? Uh, do we need a change in the creators or a change in the audience? In, in Mexico? In Mexico or in an international context? To change the cultural industry? Yeah. Uh. Last question. I think it's better okay. to leave it there. So I answered the <coughs> quickly the different question. I begin with your question. Basically, you said congratulations. So I like the question. Thank you. Uh, now, to, to go on what you said, which is very interesting about resistance. Uh, you know, a lot of people are thinking uh, culture as a necessity to resist. And they think imperialism is a matter of, uh, of money. And, you know, you have the big, uh, basically what, uh, I mean, this kind of... Uh, Castro uh, way of thinking the world, they are against you and you are resisting imperialistic things. It doesn't work like that. And it never worked, but less in a time of globalization and in a time on, uh, I would say, on digitalization. And this is why actually, the, you know, in the 70s, um, uh, I, I wrote some history about that, so I know a bit the debate. That, the debate for the gay community, for example, was okay. We want to be uh, free, okay? We are in a bad shape because they are homophobic. So our models are USSR, uh, China, Mao China, and Castro, basically. What's the idea? I mean, the gay movement, the lesbian movement, in the US, in France, in Italy, in Germany, they were thinking that the revolution, the gay revolution, will come from this directions. And then suddenly, a little bit after that, we realized that, you know, in USSR, they were putting the gays in the cold Siberia to have them doing a workforce uh, and dying in the snow. Uh, in Mao China, they were basically doing them, asking them to become farmers and die because they didn't eat anything. And in, in Cuba, basically, they put them electricity to have them becoming uh, heterosexual. Of course, it didn't work, but still, the the revolution didn't come didn't come from these places. It came more from the Castro area than from the Castros in Cuba. To summarize, so when I say that, it's uh, this idea of resistance is not, I think, the good approach on the on the question. Uh, you didn't say that, but uh, I, I kind of uh, always, you know, think that. Um, we, 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 we are afraid by balkanization of the internet and culture. We are afraid by a kind of Libanization because all the territory will keep their culture or we will have to protect it. I don't believe it works like that. First of all, if you want to succeed, succeed in, in, uh, in content industry, in soft power, 
you need great content. And to have great content, you need uh, um, freedom of artist, you need uh, diversity, you need uh, the money of the big company, but also the independent. Without independent, you won't do anything because the mainstream cannot regenerate it by itself. Uh, the mainstream is, um, is uh, good because it's the only way to speak to millions of people in one time. But when you want to do a new movie, you cannot do the same. You know, we are not speaking about Coca-Cola. We are speaking about content. And in cultural industry, the important word, word is not industry. It is culture. And every movie, even the worst, every music, even something you don't like, uh, uh, trash, reggaeton things, is a prototype. And then you need to have a new prototype when you want to create something else. And this is why, actually, the good news is the independent are extremely important. This is why diversity, the border, the, the things that are a little bit at the march. This is why, I mean, who does innovation? Who does, who, who, who take risk? Who really do innovation, research and development? It's always done by the university in the US. If you forget that, you don't understand Hollywood. Hollywood is done thanks to UCLA and to USC and to the Tisch Korea in NYU and these kind of things. And then you did um, the, the innovation by the startup, by the little guy, by the independent. And this is how today we, we believe Disney bought Pixar. But actually it's kind of Pixar that bought Disney. Because when you look at the, the animated studio within Disney, it is Pixar. So basically the independent Pixar wasn't a very small independent, <laughs> for true, it was already big. But if you take the history of Hollywood, it has been always the independent that becomes the studio. Uh, from the beginning, and when, the, when they left Edison in New York, the Jewish left to LA because they were independent and they didn't like the trust of, of, uh, of Edison. And then they create their big studios, so they became in fact, the studio themselves. But then other independents arrive, and this is why actually DreamWorks or Miramax or Pixar or the, were a key player in the game. So at the end, I, I, really, be, I really believe in this dialogue between, between the, the two, and, um, uh, and this is why the question about, uh, where the question about being in the system? Uh, yes, it's a little bit the same answer, because being in the system, Everybody is in the system. You know, in France, I read an article a few years ago, uh, like four pages, in one of the most, most famous anti-American newspapers, Telerama, very famous one, very good one, on culture. And they were speaking about the movie of Jim Jarmusch, Broken, Broken Flowers. Actually, I love Jim Jarmusch, and it's a very good movie. So it was four pages of interview with him, and they were, the journalist was like, oh yes, you fight against the, be the bad Hollywood system, and you are the independent, and how you are able to survive in this hostile world, and so on. It was like four pages of that. And Jim Jan Woos was great, and so on. At the end, you had just one line. Breaking, bro broken Flowers will be out, I don't know, next week, it was probably in October or something, it was a film of 120 minutes, a focus feature movie. Focus Feature is 100% a major. It owns 100% by Universal. So the independent is always linked with the studio in a way or another. Everybody doesn't exist one artist that doesn't want to sell. They don't want to sell out, sell out, sell out. But they want to sell because they want people. So what they want, at the same time, they want to keep their art. They want to, to, to stay you know, um, what they really believe in. So I understand that, and it's great. But the, this idea to make like the opposition of the, the independent, the big one, and so on, doesn't work. And this is why it works in the US. It, it's always all together mixed. And this is why basically the Chinese, they pour millions of dollars in their movie industry, but they haven't been able to produce one blockbuster worldwide except Kung Fu Panda, that has been made by, by DreamWorks, the US company. Why? Because they don't believe in the independent. They don't believe in the small guy, the diversity, the, the gay, the woman, the, the, the guy will be from uh, like Taiwan, like uh, Ang Lee. Ang Lee was invited 
Aishana, they really wanted to do a movie with him, and then something was wrong. A wife of a vice president, something didn't like, a picture was in the movie. They basically uh, canceled the movie, was censored, and Angli went back to the US. And this is why it's not going to work if you don't allow the artists, the freedom of artists, and, and so, Everybody is in within the system, but at the same time, the system has to allow a lot of diversity, a lot of independence, a lot, actually, of creativity. On the question on Mexico, do we need a, a, a change on cultural industries? I mean, <coughs> cultural industries, by definition, are changing all the time. They are very Schumpeterian if you understand the Schumpeter uh, name. You know, it's a famous economist. Uh, Schumpeter wrote about creative destruction. So you create, but then you destroy, and then we recreate. And in the cultural industry, especially in the digital industries, it's very Schumpeterian all the time. So you have destruction of creativity every time, but also recreation. And this is why you have a startup that it failed, you create, an, you know, the famous formula in, in Silicon Valley, fail quick which means you can fail, but don't, don't keep your company too long if it doesn't work. You fail, it's dead, you create a new one, and you go ahead and you, you move on. It's a way of thinking. So creative industries are changing all the time. So if you believe they are going to become, let's say, more regulated and the government has to do it, it has a name, it's Venezuela. And now all the telenovelas from Venezuela are made in Miami. And there is nothing in culture in Venezuela. Don't even speak about Cuba, where no books, no films, and less and less music, which is a shame. You know, to listen good Cuban music, you, you go to Miami. So it's the end of something, the end of, of, of an empire, which was a small empire, but has been long for a long, for a long time. I, I finish with the question about the gay. And I'm sorry, I, I, wasn't, uh, I didn't speak enough probably about this book, but you know, it was more media students. So if one day there is a gender studies group here, yeah, I will be happy to focus more on that. Um, but to answer the question, I mean, first of all, I won't follow you at all on what you said on, you know, go one week in Jordan, come back to Mexico, and you will tell me the difference. Yeah. So this is not the same world at all. And this is why, actually, I began my book with this cafe, which I know can be, can be closed, even because <laughs> I wrote about it, and uh, which is, of course, uh, bad as if it uh, happens. Uh, I, I know the guy. We spoke uh, quite often, so I know he opened another one, but uh, it, it's, it's a long story. Uh, but um, there is a, a country in the world today where you can get death penalty because you're gay. And there is 70 others where you can go to jail just because you're gay. Mexico is not among them. Uh, you can even marry in Mexico, a city. And this mo morning, I, I was with Marcelo E. Brown, and three times in our interview, he spoke about you know, gay marriage in Mexico. I don't know if he spoke because of me, but he was like very, you know, of course, no politicians, no politicians in China or in mid mid the Middle East or in Africa will speak even one word about uh, this issue. Then, of course, there is a question of, you know, you can, um, you can have great laws, and then uh, the, the life of the people is not necessarily a good one. And actually, all my book is about that, because laws doesn't mean reality. You have countries typically like, for example, South Africa, where in theory it's perfect, it's even the worst, the, the, the better country in the world. The constitution is gay-friendly, the only one for now, with a mention for the gay in the constitution, and sexual orientation is a constitution right in South Africa. And they have gay, gay marriage, and they have had, had that very early on. But as you know, the situation of gays, especially lesbians in, in townships, is extremely difficult with rapes. So the right doesn't mean that the reality is, is, uh, is good. Uh, on the contrary, you have country like uh, uh, Singapore, for example, where the law the homosexuality is still forbidden in Singapore. But when you go to Singapore, you will see tons of cafes and bars and clubs because they don't care. In a way, it's a little bit like that in Cuba, where officially it's still a problem in many aspects. If you create a gay association in Cuba for human rights, you go to jail. 
and I, wa I was arrested in, in Cuba for a few uh, hours. Uh, it wasn't very bad, but just because you know uh, uh, we were working with other people uh, and so on. So it's not very um, uh, the law is not good, but actually the life is kind of okay. Not totally, but at least okay, very controlled by the police, but basically uh, okay. So the legislation, the law, the reality does the, are not f the same. And there is a traditional critique by the, the Marxist, and you might know the very famous uh, w discussion by Marx on human rights and civil rights and law, saying that we don't really need, I mean, the, the human rights are not uh, are kind of uh, something that, that is not able to really protect the people. I mean, it's a long debate. So I don't believe in that once again. I think we have to begin by the rights. You need the rights. Then, of course, the rights won't do anything. But without rights, you are not able to, to change uh, uh, the situation of, of the people. And, um, uh, and to conclude, I will say that I'm very... Um, I'm very um, would say uh, interested and, and even uh, proud for, for you how uh, in Latin America you have been ahead of this trend much more uh, quicker than France, for example, or UK or Germany. You know, um, for a very long time, human rights uh, was something that were, you know, the French were doing that, the British. Um, so basically, uh, we wrote a part of the declaration, of course, the French Declaration of Human Rights in 1789, but also the 1948, and it was signed in Paris at the Trocadero. And you know, Europe is in general the you know they they explain to the world what they have to do about human rights. But on gay marriage, South Africa, actually Argentina. Mexico for one part, Brazil, Uruguay. I mean, this kind of minuscule Uruguay was before France, before I Italy, where there is not even uh, real uh, civil unions in Italy, before uh, Germany, before uh, some other country in Europe. So I conclude with that because I think it says a lot also on globalization and how emerging countries are changing the world. It's not just a question of economy, it's not just a question of demography. Emerging countries are also, I say, I say that again, but because it's an answer to your question, emerging with their culture, with their internet, and with their law and civil rights, which has been the case on the gay issue. Of course, then, there is a lot of things to do. And uh, you're young, so you have a lot of uh, years to, to change after the law, to change the prejudices. Thank you.